Welcome to the Market Roundup with Martin Pring. This is an annual tradition that was started many years ago by Martin and the Technical Securities Analysts Association of San Francisco and has since grown into an international event. This program now reaches many thousands of technicians in all corners of the globe, thanks to the International Federation of Technical Analysts, which is an affiliation of technical analysis societies across the world. Uh, And thank you to them for co-sponsoring this event. And a very special thank you to Stock Charts TV and StockCharts.com for their production assistance and generous support in making this event possible. Martin Pring, as we all know, is an icon of technical analysis. He has written many books on the subject, including the seminal work, Technical Analysis Explained, which is a true classic. He publishes the all-important monthly inner market review. Many of the studies that are going to be seen here today are published in the IMR through the course of the year. Last fall, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Federation of Technical Analysts, and he is the father of Techonomic Technical Analysis And he is here with us today to present his 2024 U.S. Equity Outlook. Martin, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bruce. Always a pleasure to be with you. So uh, without uh, further ado, let's get this uh, started because we want to hear what Martin thinks about the year ahead. Martin, 2023 was a pretty exceptional year in financial markets for many reasons. And we really want to know what you think about how 2024 could unfold. Uh, what do you, what do you have here for us? Well, we have a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to go through a, a summary, a quick summary of what I'm going to be talking about and then move on to the charts themselves. So the first thing is, The post-2009 secular bull market could be in the early stage of reversing. And why is that important? It's important because the secular trend determines the character of the primary trend that falls underneath it. So in other words, when the secular trend is up, the primary trends tend to be very strong and the corrections, the, the primary bear markets tend to be relatively weak. But when the secular trend is down, that's when the magnitude is all on the downside. Of so the- when you say, Martin, that we're post the secular bull that started in 09, that you, you believe we're in some kind of a transition? I think we're in some kind of a transition. I don't have all the proof yet, but right. I, have some, I have some warning signs. Interesting. That's really, what we, that's really what we need to bear in mind. So the third point is that the primary trend indicators right now are all basically pointing north. And we're in the kind of position where there's quite a lot of upside potential, at least in terms of time, left before it runs its course. And the other point is that the U.S. economy is experiencing escape velocity. That's where it becomes a self-sustaining recovery as opposed to an artificially stimulated one. So let's just dig, dig in now and take a look at some long-term charts. I want to point out that if you can't see the dates at the bottom of these charts, they're always summarized in the legend at the top. And when I look at these long-term charts, I like to um, adjust them for inflation. Because it's not really inflation is not really important on a day-to-day basis. But when you're t- looking at it from a long-term point of view, you could, you could make 50% in stocks. And if the CPI had gone up 50%, you wouldn't be any further ahead. So this gives us a lot of perspective as to as to what's happening over the long haul. So the U.S. stock market has undergone several secular bull markets and secular bear markets in recorded history. And recorded history goes back to the uh, early part of the uh, 19th century. And what we're seeing here is the inflation-adjusted S&P composite compared to a price oscillator calculated from a 60 or five year, 60 months or five year moving average 
divided by a 360 month moving average. So it gives us a very good rendition of what the of the direction and maturity of the secular trend is. It is by no means a precise timing device. So I'm going to put in three arrows here that kind of intersect with the four secular peaks that we've seen since 1900. And you can see if, at the tip of the arrow, they correspond reasonably well with the turning points in the in the oscillator. The signal we get from a bearish or bullish point of view is when the oscillator crosses below that dash line, which is its 48 month moving average or above it for bull market signals. And what that's telling me right now is that the trend is up, but it's started to flatten a little bit and it hasn't yet crossed below the moving average, but it is, it's definitely at an elevated level indicating that stocks are uh, overstretched on a long-term basis on the upside. So when you speak of the secular trend that started in 2009, that is the visualization of that right there with the, uh, that turn up in that indicator. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the things I've noticed is that there are two different types, or there, there tends to be two different types of top in these secular bull markets, and they have a very important difference between them. First one that occurred during 1900 to 1920, started off with an extended trading range. And in fact, although I put the peak in 1902 or 1901 over here, the 1906 high adjusted for inflation was actually higher. So that was the real secular peak. But you can see from 1901 and so on going forwards that there was really not much uh, to be gained on a long-term basis on the, by taking, say, a, a buy-hold approach. So the first type of top stop top is a trading range. And the second type is what I call an abrupt turn, like we had in 1929, where it goes straight up and straight down. And then we move over to the next secular peak in 1966. That turned out to be a trading range with a higher peak in 1968 than in 1966. And then an abrupt turn in, uh, t in, uh, in 2000. And then you can see what we have at the present time is a, a little bit of a trading range developing. And if that it does turn out to be a trading range, it will fit in with the pattern because they alternate or they have alternated since 1900 with a, uh, a trading range in, in, in the early part of the century, then an abrupt turn, then a trading range again in the 60s and 70s, then an abrupt turn and turn of the century. So that... Although we only have four data points, that that does suggest that this could be a, a a trading range environment. But the trading range environment has one characteristic in mind in, in common, and that is that as it, it, they're all they begin with excessive inflation. Remember, nineteen twenty nine began with started off with a deflationary uh, down move into nineteen thirty two. Obviously, we've had a bit of a we've had some excessive inflation in the last. Um, couple of years or so. The other thing to bear in mind is these trading ranges are all associated with rising secular trends for bonds. And the abrupt ones were all associated with secular bear markets and bonds. So there's a couple of reasons why we may be involved in the trading range. But from the point of view of what's going to happen in the next few months, it's probably not important because uh, the cyclical indicators look pretty good. Moving so the, on. In, inside these trading ranges, you you can see the unfolding trading range, which would you say that coincides with a classic business cycle, the ebb and flow of business activity, three to four year, five year cycles? Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. So let's let's move on here. I just, I'm moving back. We've got to move forward. So. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt there, but yeah. So this chart here, again, looks at inflation adjusted the S&P composite. This goes back to 1926. And the indicator in the bottom panel is the ratio between the Schiller PE, the return on stocks, earnings return on stocks, versus the yield on the, versus the 10-year yield, government yield in the US. The idea is that when it's moving up, it indicates stocks are getting more, uh, uh, people are, are getting more pop stock. I should say stocks are getting more popular when it's moving down, and people are not so keen on on uh, on stocks. 
relative to relative relative to bombs. So there are two ways of looking at this. One is to take an actual level, like I'm putting in here, and when the uh, ratio comes up to the the the, uh, the line and then reverses to the downside, that indicates that a bear market is likely in stocks. Well, obviously that worked very well for about a hundred years, about about eighty years, I should say. Uh, but in the last few years, the indicator has gone way off the charts. But one thing is well worth noting, and that is the fact that um, it reached a very high level back in uh, 2000, uh, 2022. And that indicated a, a real imbalance between um, the popularity of stocks and bonds. So the second way of looking at this is to, is to occasionally you're able to construct joint trend lines on both the stock series and the uh, ratio. And when that line gets violated, that indicates an, an important change in trend, in fact, a secular reversal in trend. We can follow this analysis all the way through until the present day. So in each time, it reliably signaled that the end of a, a, a beginning of a, a new secular bull market was beginning. Notice also sometimes the lines intersect with the moving average as well, which is a 96 month, eight year moving average, kind of like a double business cycle. So where are we today? Well, we can draw a line up through here, goes back to the 1980s, and that's a very long trend line, and it's been touched on several occasions. So it's got some significance. That indicates to me that we've, in terms of this indicator, we've, we've broken the long-term uh, momentum that began in 1982, and that's a pretty important thing. But what we haven't yet seen is a break in this trend line on the inflation-adjusted stocks as well. It got down to it a couple of times, but never went never went through. So, yeah. Martin, so that I understand this chart, the lower panel is with that huge spike in 2021, I guess it was, was a very high P.E. ratio and in the numerator and a very low interest rate of 10-year bonds. And yeah. that created that huge spike in uh, oh, very overvalued stocks and, well, in very low yields on bonds. Yeah, so that to me is is a very important piece of evidence that the secular trend may be in the process of reversing because that is an unusual signal. Just just as the extreme in 1982 on the downside was, an, was, was very unusual, and that was followed by a huge bull market afterwards. So it's very important that that right now, of course, it's still historically at an overvalued level for stocks, but it's fallen so sharply that you just know it's oversold and due for a bounce. And that bounce is going to be a, is, is what we're seeing in the, or what we have seen in the last um, year. So I'd like to spend a little time on talking about equities in the business cycle to kind of set us up for the primary trend. So here's the S&P composite going back to 1955. And you notice that it's interrupted by bear moves along the way, which we're all, we're all familiar with. The mild bear moves I'm highlighting now in these blue ellipses, and they're caused by economic slowdowns where the economy growth, the growth path in the economy slowed down, but didn't go into an actual contraction as it does with a recession. But then we also have larger bull bear markets, which were associated with the pink shading, which was actual recessions. And generally speaking, when you get a severe recession, you get a severe drop in the stock market. So all the big five were associated with recessions, all the big five that have taken place, downsides that have taken place since the 1970, uh, late 1960s. So a print turn of capital, we, what we, we do is we, we call these, we give names to these bear markets. When they're mild and they're caused by a mild recession or by a... Um, a slowdown, economic slowdown. We call those burglars because they are an irritation, but they're not. They're not. They don't give you financial ruin. Whereas on the other hand, the the bank robbers are the ones that uh, you take a long time to uh, get back to break even from the top of the previous bull market. So it's difficult. It's difficult to. Uh, they're much more severe and painful, and you really want to be able to avoid those. But remember, we had a secu some secular trends uh, in, 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 in the previous chart. 
And in this chart here, you can see that the secular trend, the secular bear market is a, is a trading range. And this secular bear market up here was a trading range. But we really need to go back and adjust this stuff for inflation. And that's what we do in the next chart. So there is the secular bull market from 1949 to 66. And then the other secular bull markets come in with these other red and green arrows. But you can see here that all the burglars occurred during secular bull markets and all the bank robbers developed during the secular bear markets. So burglars markets, bank robbers for bear market. So commonly the bank robbers are associated with periods of higher inflation? Or excessive deflation as well. Mm. You remember uh, 19, uh, 2009 here, 20, 2007 to 2009, that was the the latter part of that was associated with a huge collapse in commodity prices. So it's excessive inflation or excessive deflation that feeds these secular bear markets. So if we now look at these, uh, I uncover the lower panel, you can see here is our oscillator again. And this time it's a PPO with the, with the same parameters of 60 and 360, except that the PPO is calculated from exponential moving averages and we were looking at simple moving averages before. Exponential, of course, turn much quicker than simple moving averages. And so we're actually got a marginal sell signal at the end of December. I wouldn't go a whole bunch on that because the uh, because it's more sensitive, sometimes it can give us false signals. And I want to see a more decisive signal. But it, again, it, it doesn't it does give us the impression that the secular bear market could well be underway. It's just a warning. You notice also that the 2022 decline is in gray rather than blue or in pink, because we don't know whether that was a recession at this point or whether it was a slowdown. It was either a very mild recession, concentrated in things like manufacturing and housing, or it was a, a gross slowdown. We just don't know at this point. So that's why I've got it in gray. But it is the amount of decline is more consistent with a bank robber than it is with a burglar. And as I mentioned before, the bank robber, as you can see from this chart, the bank robbers tend to occur during the secular bear markets. So now I'd like to zero in a little bit more on the on the business cycle itself, because the business cycle is nothing more or less a set chronological sequence of events. You all, we've all heard of the leading indicators, the lagging indicators, and the coincident indicators. And they're called that for a reason, because some of the indicators like housing lead and other indicators like uh, capital spending lag the cycle. And the turning points of these various indicators is important. But for investors, the really useful part is that the turning points of stocks, bonds, and commodities are also part of this business cycle sequence and can be very helpful in determining what kind of environment we're, invest we're investing in currently. So the cycle starts off with the bonds bottoming out, and they bottom out because the demand for credit, because we're in a contractory phase, starts to decline. And because we're in a contractory phase, the, the uh, Federal Reserve starts injecting liquidity and pushes, um, and that pushes supply up. So when supply comes high, higher than demand, the price, which is interest rates, fall. When interest rates fall, bonds bottom. Well, the economy continues to contract, but at some point, the players in the stock market start to anticipate that these falling rates are going to and are going to stimulate the economy, and so stock stocks bottom out just about the point where the the, the news is at, at its blackest. But commodities continue to decline because demand is not picked up. But at some point, the recovery gets under underway, and the demand and supply for commodities comes more into balance on the demand side, so the commodity market bottoms out. That's a great period when everything is actually going up. But of course, as with all great periods, all great parties, they must come to an end. And as the Fed becomes less accommodative and commodity prices begin their upward or extend their upward path, bond prices tend to peak out. But that's still okay for stocks because the economy is still strong and it's not the economy is not being hurt by inflation. But at some point, Players in the stock market begin to anticipate the next recession or slowdown, just as they anticipated the recovery earlier. And then finally, stock commodity prices peak out. 
Now, what we've got is three markets. Each one has a peak. Each one has a trough. And that gives us six turning points in the business cycle, which is what we have in this slide here. And each of these periods is good for a certain assets. So bonds are bullish in stages one to three. And then stocks are bullish in stages two to four. And commodities are bullish in stages three to five. So at some point, everything's going up. And that's in stage three, where you can invest in anything and is a positive environment. And sometimes your, your investment are limited to bonds in stage one or bond kind of uh, type of, of stocks, interest sensitive stocks. And in another part of the cycle, only commodities and commodity driven stocks uh, tend to do well. So the question is, and we have um, at Print Turner, we have models that help determine this bonds for bonds, stocks, and commodities. So right now we're in stage two because the stock rummer is bullish and bonds and bonds are also bullish, but commodities are bearish. So here's our stock barometer as an example of one of these models. It consists of six different indicators. And when you get a, a, a reading of 50% where half the indicators are bullish, that gives us a bullish reading for the, for the barometer. But these green highlights do a little, go a little deeper. They show in the barometer is at 75% or higher. You can see that you get some really nice moves when it's at 75%. Right now it's at 83, so it's obviously reached that requirement. So it's a, it's, we get this green highlight in the chart. So that's, that's, that's one of the indicators that's very positive. That doesn't tell us that we're going to have a good stock market for the next year or two, because it's only as good as the latest data and the latest trend. But right now it's, it's 83%. And looking positive. And Martin, let me just say that in addition to printturner.com, where you uh, are managing portfolios using this research and among all the other research you do, but also the Intermarket Review publishes this information and the, the uh, sector analysis and the business cycle work on a monthly basis. And so people can go to the Intermarket Review to be able to follow uh, this research. Yeah, this is this is basically a, the charts are taken from the from the Intermarket Review. Yeah. One of our, the indicators we use at Pring Turner is the Pring Turner Leading Economic Indicator, and it's not shown in this chart. What is shown is a derivative of it, an oscillator of it, because it can help us determine when uh, a recession is likely to take place. So the red highlights in this chart here indicate recessions. And the red line down at the bottom in the recession caller area of the chart is what we call a recession line, because every time the recession line goes below that, every time the, I should say, the caller, the recession caller goes below the recession line, that indicates to us that a recession is either started or is about to get underway or is, is, is getting underway. And you can see that the, zero, the red line crossovers have been pretty consistent. One major failure occurred in 1966 <clears throat> when the indicators de deteriorated, but not to the extent that it was classified as a recession. So the other point of the chart is that it also tells us when you get to escape velocity. In other words, when a recovery tends to be sustainable. And that is when it crosses above the zero line. And you can see that if you look at where the recession is, you see the recession typically ending or has ended already when this indicator goes positive above the zero line. And it's it's been pretty consistent. So it's, it, it's telling you two things. One is that when you go above zero, you probably got a lot. The recovery probably has a long way to go, and 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 number two, that's typically a good point, a good place for um, purchasing stocks on a long term basis. So it's it's just gone. You you can hardly see it in this chart, but it's just gone bullish. And what I can do is show you on the next chart. You can see that the preliminary data. Well, first of all. It almost went into a, it. It did sort of marginally signify a recession earlier, early in, well, not really earlier this year, earlier last year, and at the end of the the year of, of 2022. 
but it's since recovered from that. So it was never a decisive recession signal like this one here was or the one in 2000. And now it's gone on to show a recovery. And based on the historical chart we saw earlier, that suggests that there's quite a lot of time left in this next recovery. So it's back above zero on a preliminary basis for December. <clears throat> and this is showing you just the, the last couple of signals that took place, or last three signals that took place. Very encouraging. Yeah. Now, remember from the chart I showed you earlier, Bruce, that stocks the stocks make a bottom and then commodities lag further further down the road of making their bottom. So you can make an indicator which divides stocks by commodities, which is what I've done in this chart, except I've taken the velocity of it or the momentum of it in the form of a long-term KST. And when the KST of this stock commodity ratio bottoms out, typically that's occurring around stage two or on only stage three, and you can see that if I put these arrows in at these moving average crossovers, that you get some very nice, timely buy signals from a long-term perspective. And right. of course, a reminder to people that stage two to stage three, you're getting into one of the periods that is really uh, best for investors in, in the typical business cycle. Yeah, well, stage two is actually by far the best, uh, not only because it gives you the greatest gains. Just think of what we've we just come through since October. Um, but it's also a broad, it, it broadens out, the gains broaden out and uh, to virtually every sector. So stage two is, a, is a, a golden period for investing in stocks. So looking at the current position of this indicator here, you can see that it's just a little bit below zero. And um, it's got a long way to go before it gives us a sell signal. And even when you get the sell signals, they haven't been they haven't been as reliable as the buy signals. Those dash ones are kind of showing us when the um, indicator went bearish by the reversal in the direction of the uh, KST. So we all know that the stock market, the economy does well when uh, liquidity is increasing. This chart here is showing you the real M2 on an 18-month rate of change basis. And the idea is that when, in order to get a bear market, you have a reduction in the rate of change of real M2, and that, 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 that causes a squeeze in the economy, and the stock market anticipates that. But on the other hand, when the indicator, and you can see how it, it, it dropped sharply here in the early part of the 20th century, so when it starts to um, go below the minus five line, that's that's a very oversold or overstretched level, a very restricted level in terms of monetary policy on this particular indicator, and starts to reverse to the upside. It represents a good buying opportunity for stocks. You can see all the way through that you get a good buying point. Many mm. people have been worried about M2 having been so negative but it's interesting the perspective that you bring with your study here about M2 uh, going below minus 5% and then turning back up again because yes, it's uh, a distinctly bullish uh, store, uh, theme. Yeah, absolutely. It's not M2 itself. It's M2 divided by the CPI, so it's real M2. So it's giving mm -hmm. you a reflection of what's going on. Um, if you look at the current situation, you never know for sure because this is a fairly jagged indicator, but it looks to me like that's bottomed out. And it's bottomed out from a pretty low level. Not a record low, but a, a low level. And that suggests to me that the stock market, based on where it's gone in the past, is likely to move higher. This chart here, again, compares the inflation-adjusted S&P composite. This time it's to a financial velocity momentum Financial velocity, in my view, or my definition, is measured, or in terms of this indicator, is measured in terms of taking a cop up curve for bonds, for stocks, and for commodities, a measure of each of these asset classes, and combining them into one indicator. Indicating when money is flowing into the economy, it should lift financial markets in aggregate. And if you look at the uh, First of all, red highlights represent recessions. And if you look at the um, 
low points in this indicator, it indicates two things. One is that it's normally towards the end of a recession, if a recession has transpired. And second, it's usually a great buying opportunity for stocks. Those periods where it wasn't a great buying opportunity are shown with these dashed arrows. But by far the mo most of these examples were followed by a good rally in stocks, a, a primary turn, in fact. Right now, that indicator is still at a pretty subdued level and is leaving lots of room in, in 2024 to get up to a higher level. Remember, even if this is a secular bear market, it is a secular trading range, it still has a long way to go just to get the back to break even. And remember, in the other trading ranges, this rally here, like the 1968 rally, actually went on to make a new high. Although I, I'm a little cautious on the, on the secular trend, uh, it seems to me that the primary trend certainly has a lot of potential, upside potential in 2024. Martin, I have to just say that that indicator is exactly the reason why you are the father of techonomic technical analysis. That is just such a creative indicator. Thank you, Bruce. I'm, I'm flabbergasted here. <laughs> okay, the next chart shows S&P composite. This time it's not inflation adjusted with a long-term KST or a long-term smooth momentum of the dividend yield. So when the stock market's selling off, the dividend yield tends to move up. And when it reaches the peak and starts to come down, that's when we get a buy signal from this indicator. And you can see it, it's one of the most consistent indicators I know of. And we can, one of the great things is you can trace it back to the, uh, to the late 19th century. And it's given good and consistent results. So it gave a buy signal a little while back. But in terms of turning negative, it's, it's got a long way to go. It's only just started to turn down. So again, that suggests the primary trend has, has more to run on the upside here. Martin, could you interpret this, that this is a good time in the stock market to capture good stocks with dividend yield? Well, since we're in stage two, um, and it's a very broadly based rally, I, I think you can sort of say that to the whole market really is, is, is a buy. Because if your dividend yields are uh, about to reverse into a downward direction, based on this long-term KST, that to, to lock in those good yields seems like it would be a, be a long-term appropriate strategy. Oh, I, I, absolutely. Unless, of course, interest rates started to turn around and go up again. But we don't think that, I don't think that's likely for a while. Because even though the economy, in my view, and you saw the, uh, the, the recession caller, has gone bullish, it's interesting that rates usually decline after that's gone bullish for a while because pressure from commodity prices is not that high. It's only when you get later in the cycle that commodity prices adversely affect interest rates and stocks. So I just put that line in there because that's where a lot of these uh, KSTs started to reverse before. If we go down to, uh, and they've been lower, of course. So again, kind of trying to indicate that this is an early part of the cycle here. And that's what stage two is, tends to be an early state, early part of the cycle. So again, that suggests that to me that there's still plenty of upside potential. So here's the calculation of uh, the results on this, on this indicator. So this is the buy hold. On the buy hold from 1874, uh, has averaged 5.8% on an annualized monthly basis when you adjust stock prices for inflation. So that's the buy-hold approach. And of course, the buy-hold approach is on for 100% of the time. Then we take the periods when the KST is bearish, when, it was, when, it's, when it's rising and we're in a bear market. The, annual, the annualized annual return is 1.3%, considerably less, but still, still positive. And then we take it when the indicator is bullish, when it's below its moving average and declining because we're in a bull market, the average annualized return, monthly return is 10.2%. And that's on about 52% of the times. So it's well worth, well worth watching. Dramatic, impressive. 
Yeah, this chart here is slightly different, Bruce. What we're looking at here is investors' intelligence. And as we all know, the investors' intelligence monitors newsletter writers, such as the Intermarket Review, and um, tries to find out whether they're bullish or bearish from what they read. And it, they tend to use it as a contrary indicator, and it works very well as a contrary indicator. This is taking it a little step further by running a 50-week moving average, that's the green line, and a 180-week moving average, which is the blue line, and seeing when the the fifty day the fifty week moving average crosses above the um, hundred and eighty, and you can see that it's returned some pretty good long term buy signals in the past. Nothing is perfect, of course, and there's a couple of fake signals here or false signals I put in to show you. But when it goes when it goes bullish, it tends to be followed by a long term uh, bull market. So it's it's not a contrary indicator in this case. It's 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 a trend indicator, and um, it's just gone. It just crossed above it the blue the fifty day fifty week crossed above the one hundred eighty week uh, at the end of December. So we we got another signal here. The other thing to point in mind, bear in mind, is the fifty day moving average moved down to a really big extreme of minus of thirty five percent before it before it crossed. And it did the same thing in the um, in 2009, and also back here in 1995. All these all these bull markets were quite strong and quite lengthy. So again, that's a positive indication that got down to such a low level, and then rallied back above the 180 degree series. So that's a positive cross now. It seems like this indicator is a great visual of uh, investors beginning to embrace the bull trend that the that they're uh in the early stages of recognizing that this trend has gone into a bullish mode and it's still early yeah i, I think that's a, that's a very good point bruce yeah so now we're looking at um the global indicator or a global indicator the msci world stock etf the acwi and underneath is its special k which is an indicator I developed based on adding up a short-term measure of momentum with an intermediate measure of momentum and a long-term measure of momentum all into one series to try and catch whether or not that series was peaking or troughing on a cyclical basis. And if you look at these arrows, you see the arrows intersect with the low point and the high points of these moves here. So the special K will peak or trough usually within a little while, maybe two or three or four weeks of the final turning point of a primary bull market or a primary bear market. It doesn't always work out that way because sometimes you get linear trends where you get the usual divergences uh, or you may get abrupt reversals of trend due to uh, like you had with the, um, the COVID uh, experience where everything was going up and then it turned down abruptly. So it doesn't always work out that way. But if you if you knew that that was the top, which you do, or the bottom, which you do with the benefit of, hind <clears throat> benefit of hindsight, then it can be very helpful. We don't have the benefit of hindsight in the real world, of course. So how do we get around it? So one is to look at the special case position relative to its signal line, the red line. If it's, above, if it's just crossing above, Generally speaking, that will indicate a new uptrend is going on. Unfortunately, it can be volatile in other, in other areas. So you have to kind of look back and see whether or not it worked in previous cycles or not. A more reliable way is to draw a trend line on the special K when you can and construct one for the price. And when you get the joint break, then you get the reversal signal. We can do that for a number of sell signals since uh, 19, 2016. So it's not always possible to draw these trend lines and look at these crossovers and so forth. But right now it is, and that's good, because it's just the special K has just broken out of a base, and the um, MSCI itself, uh, in World ETF, the ACWI, has also broken out of a reverse head and shoulders. There's the shoulder, there's the head, and there's the shoulder. So that looks, that looks pretty good from a point of view, a, a global aspect. So I'm, I'm very encouraged with that. And it's just happened. 
Now we're looking at finally at how a sector can help us identify not long-term buying opportunities in the stock market. What we're looking at here is a momentum indicator, a KST, based on the ratio between the financials, the financial ETF and the S&P composite. So the green shaded areas represent when the financials are outperforming the S&P. And that, if you can look at the green shading here, is where stocks have a, a tendency to, to move higher. If they, it, just because it's crossed below, it's moving average here, doesn't mean to say that stocks can't go down. It's just that they're most vulnerable when this indicator goes negative. Well, right now it's negative, but it's just started to edge up slightly, suggesting that um, financials are about to outperform the rest of the market or the market as, itself. So that basically completes what I have to say, uh, Bruce. I don't know if you have any more observations. Well, the uh, and certainly that last indicator seemed to indicate uh, that it coincides well with stages two, three of the business cycle and that it's a, uh, uh, a period. And of course, that's the period when the stock market is longest and strongest because it coincides well with uh, growing business activity. So uh, very encouraging. Martin, you are absolutely a gift. We s so appreciate your thoughts and your time and your great work. Uh, any final thoughts? Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, there is one that I had, and, and that is that um, this, while the position of these indicators suggests that they have lots of potential before they get overstretched on the upside, which is a normal way it happens, they could, it is possible for them to turn up during the course of the year. Because last year, I did the outlook and I was, I was quite bearish coming into uh, 2023. But by March, the indicators have changed and have gone bullish. So I turned bullish. So the outlook that I'm giving you here is, is based basically on the fact that that's the turn of the indicators as they are at the present time. And it's likely to continue because they're not overstretched. But they could conceivably turn in the middle of the year, especially with all the volatile political activity and uh, uh, military activity that's going on around the world. So just bear that in mind. It's not a guarantee that we're going to have a, a, a super bullish year for 2024, but the, the odds, I think, favor it. Well, Martin, I want to remind people that they can follow your work throughout the course of the year, month by month by month, by uh, following the Martin Pring Intermarket Review. Also, go to pringturner.com for great content there. And uh, you can follow Martin's views consistently over time. And Martin also writes a blog at stockcharts.com, which is available to subscribers. So there's many, many ways to follow uh, Martin's work and his thinking. And Martin, you're just a treasure. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bruce.